your undergrad in uh, Western, uh, London, Ontario, and then you moved uh, to Yale for a PhD, and uh, then afterwards uh, to Ohio State for a little bit later. And you're probably going to hear about the next few months. Which is not a talk on start. Russell's daughter was the one who started it. And Frank Edmondson's book. That makes sense. Gretchen sat about there. Rapidly knitting. And then asked me for the sweater I was wearing. The first question during the talk was, was the sweater I was wearing something that I had The answer was yes, and that was good. Um, this is not something I think. Okay. All right. What we're going to talk about today is modular clusters. Most of the slides are not this dark. This is, um, whenever I come to talk about globular clusters, especially with people who don't work on them and with the theorists, who I like to put on a picture, this is what we're talking about. Okay. Um, this is NGC 2808, the second most massive globular cluster in the galaxy. Um, nice spherical system, aren't they pretty? And if you ask anyone who teaches first year astro, we know. All of our these guys. Okay. So they're old dense star systems, they're 10 to 12 years old. That used to be a problem back when the whole concept was not in that value, but now it's okay. Um, we're talking about about 100,000 stars per cluster, and there's about 150 in the Milky They're all mostly in the Halo Central figures. What we tell our first year astronomy class is that all the stars in the cluster form at the same time, the same place, from the same material. And so they're very simple stuff. Use them um, uh, for calibration of, of spectral synthesis models. We can use them to investigate galaxy formation. You can see the trace of the galaxy was formed, and they have come from other things, and so on. Um, they've also been used as ideal representations of the end mode gravitational problem because we have a bunch of point masses running around and the gravity. We use them to figure out cell resolution. These are really, really boring. evidence that this all the same place at the same time and from the same material is not But let's start with what we do know. This is a magnitude diagram of NGC 5466, which is a vaguely unremarkable globular cluster. This is um, ACS observations from the ACS cluster, cluster survey. And beautiful color magnitude diagram. If you like CMDs, this is the kind of thing you'd like. These are isochrones, and you can see that this isochrone at 12 giga years exactly fits the cluster. So what else do we have here? We've got some binary stars up here. We've got some blue stragglers up here. That's a whole other sequence of talks I can give you. But otherwise, we completely understand. This is a single population. All these stars were born at the same time. This is not news. This is what we've been teaching our kids in the last year. However, not all globular clusters <coughs> have such beautiful color magnitude there. This is Omega 7, which is a massive globular cluster. And, well, yeah. So, what have we got? Multiple subgiant branches, that's a problem. Multiple giant branches, that's a problem. Really bizarre horizontal branch, which, you know, horizontal branch, which is supposed to be horizontal. It's supposed to be down, and this one might even have a V where they come back up again. Something is not quite right, right? Um, lots of blue stragglers. That's okay. Blue stragglers are known to be very bizarre, not single populations. Don't worry about those. It's a no problem. But the rest of this, all this mess here, is indicative of something else going on. And some of the something else that's going on in the set is that we have different populations with different iron levels. So it's not a single population. And we know this by cross spectroscopically. We can measure the, the iron abundances. And these different branches have different iron abundances. That's been known for quite a while, actually, and understood. Um, more recently, in 2004, you can sort of see the red point. We have multiple main sequences here. There's one here, and there's one there. Um, the, 2006, um, 
explanation is that this sequence has a much higher helium content than your standard 0 0.23, 0 0.24, 0 0.25, whatever you think is the primordial value. That's a bit odd. And in fact, if you look and you take these kind of populations and ask what is the horizontal branch, you can get these guys, which are very extreme, if you have a helium abundance of y of 0.4. 4 is, oh my god, that's really huge, how on earth did you do that kind of large. Right? So, this poses some problems for the theorists, but as you know, being theorists, it's not really a problem, it can be a slightly more interesting. Um, but where there's an easy solution. This is not a modular cluster. This, what makes sense, is probably the nucleus of the dwarf galaxy we got eaten by the Milky Way. So of course it has multiple populations, of course it has multiple iron abundances. Don't worry about it. We still understand it's the clusters. Yeah. No. Then we start looking more closely at other blood clusters. This is 2808. This is the, the main sequence of the <coughs> magnitude diagram. That's the one I showed you the picture of at the beginning. This is 6752, and medium massive sort of nearby where it will study globular cluster. And this one has one, two, three main sequences, which are very spread out here on the sort of lower main sequence. When you hit the turn off, they're one. They're absolutely on top of each other. We're not talking about three different age populations as we see in some more galaxies where you see one, two, three turn offs. Something else is going on. 6752 is not so clear, but this spread is much larger than the observation errors. So we have something else going on. So, multiple main sequences. Indirect evidence, indirect evidence for higher helium. Helium is really, really hard to observe except in the hottest stars and these are most definitely not those. These are less than 20 solar masses. Main sequence stars. <laughs> um, the iron abundances are the same from star to star in almost all points. Now we have a handful where this is not true. Any sense being one? M54 being another, which is the um, the, the core of the Sagittarius core, the core of the Sagittarius core. And you see 1851, which is another fairly massive cluster. So I'm quite sure, but are trying to link to some of these new stellar streams that people are observing. And then M22, where the evidence is, is pretty weak, uh, the argument goes that. I can observe my abundances really, really, really accurately, and this spread is bigger than I think my error bars are. But those four, and everything else that we've looked at, the iron abundance is not the same. That means we haven't had supernovae in 10 But we have something else going on. If we look at other parts of the color magnitude diagram, we also see these kind of splits. These are a bunch of sub diagrams. Stars just just finished running out of hydrogen in the course, working on on uh, hydrogen burning shells and, and heating core. Um, this one's quite this is an interesting 1851 where there's this possible um, iron bodies here, but it's a very clearly split um, subject. The main sequence looks the same. Up before you start seeing the verge up. 
No, no, I know, but I mean, can you are you saying that if the, the same age you change the CNO and it, it makes this different turn so that means the life of the star is actually affected by that CNO. Age, uh, a little bit. Yeah. But it's, it's an, I guess obviously it's enough, but how much of the CNO change do you think? Um, about 0.2 down.
which is causing some stars to have much, much lower oxygen. Remember, this is, so this is O over F E and N A over F E. So, so logarithmic compared to uh, iron. We're down by one and a half X in oxygen. And we can be up by almost an X in sodium. So what do we have going on that can cause some stars in a blood in the to have low oxygen, high sodium, same iron, something really going on. And the interesting thing is that all blood in the clusters seem to do this. Every single cluster that's been studied well shows this same thing, shows these lines. These clusters are in order by mass. So this is a quite low mass blood in the So the effect seems to get bigger. You get more spread along these lines. Um, and you get more and more massive clusters. What do you these lines? Sorry? What do you these lines? These lines? These lines? No. Those are a model, uh, a very simplistic model. If you take the most extreme sodium and oxygen values um, that, that we see basically from this cluster, and then dilute it, in varying amounts with normal uh, down here, sodium oxygen values. So if you take 100% weird, you get this point, and 100% normal is over here, and the line is 50% you know, Okay. So now it's becoming more clear. Something is going on in all these books. Every cluster we've looked at has seen, we've seen some kind of weird color magnitude diagram D. Sequence of the subject branch, broader branches, we should. And we've got these light element issues. Um, the iron is the same. And there may be this different spatial distribution. The spatial stuff is, has only been coming in the last couple of years, but it seems to be present in all. some people to postulate a new definition of a blood river cluster. A blood river cluster is now not a large, spherically symmetric, self-gravitating system of 100,000 stars and so on. It's a system which shows this spread in light element lines. Personally, I think this definition is a bit focused on what we do for a living, but it's kind of interesting. If you use this definition, the minimum present-day mass for blood river cluster is 40. Open clusters do not show this. Period. Done. In fact, there's quite a strong line um, in, in the plot of showing versus not showing, or, or some <laughs> measure of this spread. The spread of it is correlated with the mass. So something's going on here that, that's caused by mass and seems to be linked to present. So we see it in clusters in the LMC, um, but only down to this mass. Oh, okay. Um, and it is not seen in, in, in galactic open clusters. Again, most of those are solar metals that are higher. But basically, so far, Strong in CH band, nitrogen, fluorosmin, rich, that was me. 
I've done on giants. Right? There are normal stars, field stars, they also. Field stars follow the same trend. Um, originally, when people started looking at, at weird abundances in giant red stars, you know, there's a lot of models had to do with something that happened internally in the star as it evolved up the giant red um, That probably still happens because we do see some of these. We see them changing with luminosity as well. However, these other um, indicators have been seen in turn off stars. In turn off stars have done absolutely nothing interesting in their lives. They have not evolved in any particular way. They can't change their surface abundance by themselves under everything we know about, about them. Stars. So, this is inherent in the birth of these, of these stars. Something has changed about the, the gaps where they come from. The other group is opposite in all these things. And the implication is from mostly from um, some magazine diagram studies is that these are really rich. So people have said, well, obviously we have a first generation and a second generation. What about that isochronic? Well, you know, here's, so here's the story. And bear with me, there are holes in this story, and we'll get to those for the rest of the time. But here's the story when you're talking to the general audience. First, we form a protoplasm. Then we take this first generation of stars, gets to the point of burning hydrogen at temperatures of about 70 or 80 um, million degrees. That stuff gives us, if you burn hydrogen at those temperatures, not only do you get the CNO cycle going on, but you get the next two cycles going on, uh, sodium neon and aluminum magnesium. Ones that are not tied in standard cell structure class because practically don't happen. But they do exist. We need them now. If you take this material, which is processed, hydrogen burning to helium, and then remove from the stars, so it's not burn the next step. You cannot have helium being burned. So let's imagine now that we can remove it from the star. We're going to stick it in the center of the bundle of cluster, and then we're going to form a second generation of stars. And after we've done that, then the cluster can evolve passively in the way that we know and want the cluster to evolve. Well, how many people have found holes? Okay. Let's start with the abundances, which is really where this, this field started in terms of observation. Why on earth are we doing this? Well, we need something which reaches temperatures of 70 million Kelvin, but does not progress to human okay? That part, well, we'll come. We also, in order to explain the observations that I showed you, the abundance observations, we also need to include dilution by primordial material. So not only do we need to take this process gas, but we then need to go off to the interstellar medium, collect up a bunch of normal gas, and stick that into the globular cluster too, to form stars. And we can't do this just once and then mix it all up. If we don't have two groups of we have this line. Well, some are bare by model, right? There are two main sequences or three journals. So in the color magnitude diagram, yes, you do see splits and, and two groups and so on. In the abundance stuff, it's a continuum. Now, do we believe that the observational errors are small enough that we can say it's a continuum or not two groups of large error bars? Personally, is one that does not do the observations. I'm not convinced of that. But people who do the observations seem to think that you know, they are seeing the distribution. As I mean, that's, that, that's, it's nice to argue about that one. The other one is, is if you look at the picture, oh, that's my model. Or it tri -model. Is, and it is for the most massive clusters where it's the most obvious. I see. And then when you go to the slightly less massive clusters, it's they get closer and closer. Okay. We can 
argue with that. Yeah, anyway, go on. Okay. But I don't want to mark the time. The argument is that there is a very true distribution of human elements, like the elements in this context. Depending on which papers you read, there are three groups of human. There are four groups of human. There's a spread in human. There's no spread in human at all except for five stars. Helium comes in most in the horizontal branch stuff, and people don't seem to agree. No, it's also the base sequence, right? You want to make this metal, more metal rich one. Just for omega sense. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And that one we throw out of it. Yeah. So more omega sense, but okay. <coughs> all right. So let me sorry, but let me go on now for the yes. other main sequences, which are at least spread. Mm -hmm. Is that still thought to be spread in helium or not? It is still thought to be spread in helium. Abundances. Let's go back to our scenario here. Basically, the abundance is more or less working. If you invoke these kinds of polluters and leave the 
last in the blood group clusters, then yeah, it's not so bad. It can actually more or less happen. We have to worry about masses. I don't mean the masses of the stars, I mean the masses of the clusters here. So let's assume that our proto blood group cluster forms with the normal initial mass function. That's fine. Really, what are you going to do to say that it doesn't form with the normal initial mass function? Um, if that's true, then the, the mass of the initial cluster form had to be at least 10 times the mass of the current cluster. And the reason it had to be that way is that we see more or less equal numbers of first generation and second generation stars in current blood groups. If you add up how much mass AGB stars can pollute the interstellar medium with, it's not that much. So if you have equal numbers of things made for A to B star ejecta and not, then you either have to you have to have a whole lot more of the A to B stars than um, it looks like you should give the current mass of the cluster. The reason I put probably here is that some of the first papers that came out on this subject were involving all kinds of crazy IMFs, including ones that looked almost like delta functions at right at the mass of the A to B stars, which I thought was kind of uh, we have to lose 90% of the first generation stars because we don't see them right now. Um, dynamically, we can do that. We can take uh, clusters and uh, as they evolve, as the, the, the first little while, the stars lose mass, for example, the cluster can expand and it can the galaxy, we can lose stars and so on. Um, Losing 90%, well, not totally everything. Now we're going to form our second generation of stars from this stuff which is gathering in the, <laughs> in the uh, core of the blood group cluster. Well, what are we going to do about the IMF here? Well, let's assume a normal IMF. Because really, what else are we going to do? Um, the probably here being that in order to get around some of this and this problem, people have been saying that we don't form a single star more massive than the current turnoff mass. Point eight seven months. Now, if anyone in this room can figure out why I am actually talking at point eight solar masses, tell me. And then we have to lose nine or very, very little of the second generation. A, because we we run into the equal numbers of stars in the two generations, probably even more so if you lose more of the second. The other reason is that we do not see, there's some evidence to suggest that this may not be a totally true statement, but up until about six months ago, it was true that in the literature we do not see a single halo star with low oxygen and high sodium. And if you believe some models of how the halo was formed, it was formed in part by ripping apart blood group clusters. Blood group clusters that didn't quite make it to the present day. That means that every single star that formed in this second generation stayed in the cluster. Well, they're also more centrally concentrated. Well, they are more centrally concentrated, yeah. so it might not be that hard to do. But none? So, in the last six months, two papers have come out. Uh, one looking at sodium oxygen, one looking at carbon uh, and nitrogen abundances, and the numbers, the limits are now about 1% of the halo. Could be the second generation of stars. That makes me feel a whole lot better, actually, um, to have some halo stars. Okay. How close are these two double
The difference in age between generation one and generation two has to be about 30 to 100 million years. That's not very long. Um, it has to be in this range because, well, AGB stars of the right masses are about 100 million years. How old they are before they get to that stage. Uh, the rapidly rotating mass of stars are more like 30 million years. Um, more importantly, it can't be much, much bigger than this because we, we didn't notice this until five years ago. These really are single age clusters. Um, and then there's another issue with the time scale which has to do with more or less have the abundances right. We don't have the abundances right perfectly. Um, particularly when you start looking at things like aluminum and magnesium, you need to change the reaction rate by two or magnitude or something like that to, to get the abundances to work properly. Yeah, you know, two orders of magnitude and reaction rates of not very well studied uh, reactions is probably not so bad, but it would be nicer if we're less. Than we have to retain all this mass in the cluster, all this gas. And so some people have invoked things like the memorial dark matter halos for modular clusters, sit stuff in. That makes some people happy and some people very unhappy. I'll about that later. I said that we had to bring in primordial gas and other things. Well, how do we do that? Um, there is. What's your answer to the argument for why? Thank you. 
Oh, it now tells you a, a little bit. It tells you how much mass you actually keep in the cluster, and it's not that much. And that would be a general worry. And you can say that it's if you need wind to stay there, but why are there no HE winds that's staying right there right now? Well, we know right. they're not, actually. Yeah, exactly. We've done spencer exactly. observations, and, and right. M15 is down at 10 to the minus 5, so we have some the region or something like that. Right. So that's the other question.
the non-horizontal part of the horizontal part. Um, so, metallicity is the first parameter. Higher metallicity, more red horizontal part. What's the second parameter? Well, let me see. Helium was proposed back in the 60s and 70s, and then people said, no, 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 no. Can't be done. Well, let's re-invoke it and see what happens. And what happens is that it seems to work. This is a plot. This is uh, one of these guys who's moving into abundances. Um, this is the inner quartile range of the oxygen over sodium, or the magnesium over sodium. Basically, the length, some measure of the length of that curve in those, those plots, versus the maximum temperature of the horizontal range, which is a, a measure of how the and there seems to be a correlation in the sense that the more spread you get, the lower the horizontal, the extent of the horizontal branches. So that's, that's really good. You mm -hmm. actually understand something. And all the quibbles about the model aside, we have a way of making different things. OK, the other thing, and this is, this is sort of a subtlety of stellar evolution, but I really like this result. Um, as stars evolve, low mass stars evolve, they go up the, the red giant branch, and then they go, as soon as the helium branch starts, they go to the horizontal branch. But they have to lose something like 0 0.2 to 0.3 solar masses between somewhere on the giant branch and the horizontal branch. Okay, fine. They also have to have a spread in mass loss to actually make a spread along the horizontal branch. Because if you just do a stellar evolution track, uh, for say, take a mass, 0.8 solar mass, goes up like this, and then you say, okay, it's going to lose a certain amount of mass, and then it ends up there, point, not spread, point. So how do you make this happen if you assume that all your stars are born at the same time and all the stars that are on the red giant branch have the same mass? You invoke a Gaussian spread in mass loss. Why? Because Gaussian is nice. Um, and the width of that spread is a free frame. And it's a free parameter with a fairly large, it's like 0.1 solar mass. If we invoke instead of spread in helium, then we can reduce this spread in mass loss by at least an order of magnitude. And in fact, in some countries, it goes to basically nothing. It's not a spread in mass loss because of something we don't understand. It's a spread in mass loss because of the different helium abundance for different evolution as they go up So again, we don't really understand why blood the cluster should have different helium or lots of problems in the model, but if they do, it solves another problem. It's a evolution. Okay, so <coughs> what exactly can I get out of this problem? I've tried to look at, at different pieces of this problem um, and put constraints on some of the crazier parts of the model. One of the things I did fairly early with the postdoc in my practice was look at um, this is, is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or all three abundances versus helium abundance. This was a question of can we hit helium values that are really ridiculously high? And the answer is yes for two different uh, two different models of AGB star fields. The answer is yes for these yields. This is carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen all together. But there's another observational constraint, which is the sum of those three has to be constant, because we're not producing any of them through the helium brain. So the answer from this paper was, yes, we can get to ridiculously high helium values, but only if our CNO goes up by an order of magnitude. Or our CNO can change not by so much, but this turned out to be um, maybe not as much of a problem because it's really only the first few clusters, the first most massive clusters that have a really, really high human abundance predictions of 0.35 or 0.4. And so maybe most clusters seem to require something like 0.28. So that's why. Okay. Um, the other thing I did is I said, well, AGB stars can probably do this. Massive stars, rapidly rotating massive stars can do this. And a lot of papers when this one came out were talking.
talking about is it ATP stars or massive stars? So I said, well, folks, let's all get together and see if we can both. Maybe that will solve some of our math problems. Right? There's nothing which says you can't have both rapidly rotating massive stars and ATP stars. And then just for yucks, I threw in something that a postdoc of mine has been working on uh, runaway collisions. If you have a really, really dense cluster early on and you have enough massive stars, they will dynamically integrate to the center, run into each other, and create a really, really big star. This was first discovered by people who were trying to create IMBHs in the mass black holes, and four solar mass black holes, and three solar mass black holes in one of the clusters. That turns out not to work because these really massive stars have really massive winds, and they merge themselves to shreds. No IMBH, but a lot of mass for the second generation, and guess what the abundances are like? Super low oxygen, super high sodium, exactly what we needed. This is the uh, my sketch around the box of the observations. These are pollution, uh, sorry, uh, dilution models. There's the primordial abundance. And uh, if you use, so there's a runaway, runaway plus the massive stars and so on. The answer was the abundance is working, the mass is. We still don't have enough mass to include every single pollution mechanism we can think of and normal IMF. We still don't have that. So the one way we can make like work like generating a fair mass for what you want to call mass is coming like that? Well, the way runaway collisions work is that you get um, so the two most massive stars or two of the most massive stars run into each other. And they stay, you know, then pretty big for a while and other things keep coming in and so on. You do end up with something like, this particular model was 750 solar masses of star running into each other. It lost 695 in winds in the same time as it was colliding. So you ended up with a 50 something solar mass star which turned into a 10 solar mass star. But that, but that, but all the winds were awesome. Please, sorry. All A lot of that wind that you're processing, not all of it, but one thing. Um, we assumed, we assumed a thousand, so, uh, sorry, a thousand kilometers per second for the winds while it was doing its windy thing, but every time it collides, you also lose a fraction of material, and that stuff is slow. So we did two calculations. We did one with keeping everything in the cluster, and then we did one in the
So I will just leave you with a lovely pretty picture of a <coughs> simple start. Thank you. 
observations stuff is really only the observations from 